Good morning. <coughs> and may I thank the organizers extremely sincerely for this invitation to, to be here. UNU Wider is this kind of very pre prestigious place um, that trickles down all over the world, and it's really a delight to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and just bef before beginning to talk about the Child Support Grant, um, I, on the program it says um, that it'll be about the elderly pensions as well. That was a, a mistake in the programming. However, I will be re uh, referring to the elderly, the pensions for elderly people quite a lot. Um, and the second is that the um, title of this, of this panel about sort of emerging social protection is slightly different for South Africa in that the grants and pensions in South Africa, the non-contributory grants and pensions started in the 1930s. But there was, there was, always, there was this gap when we moved into post-apartheid time. Um, there was an anomaly there in policy which needed to be solved. And the, um, the third thing, quickly, is that I was, we were asked, I took my brief as, const as, as concentrating on the institutional issues rather than, than on the most fascinating labor market issues that you've just been talking about, Santiago. It's, it's most thought-provoking. Thank you. The broad South African context of democratic transition were extremely severe, obviously, um, patterns of racialized poverty and inequality. And with the question there, well, what, what, is the, what is the role for the new state? The previous state had, in fact, had quite a, 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 an impressive but very racially biased array of, of, um, of welfare uh, measures. Um, the pressing need for the spatial reintegration of racially separate administrations. It's, um, it's kind of hard to reimagine that time now, but there were 17 completely separate racially se separate, separate welfare administrations. They were like different countries. It wasn't that they were different departments. Um, so to, to the, the new South African government made the most extraordinary success of rapidly integrating these previously separate administrations. Um, the changing world of work was upon us with less, very high employment rates, unemployment rates, then less income security and very high unemployment. And then in 1991, just beginning the absolute recognition of what the HIV and AIDS epidemic was go going to do with a very high burden of care and the realization that state spending on health and welfare has a very small fraction of the total amount of caring that needs to be done. And the social assistance legacy, they had the previous apartheid government had already, by 1993, reached parity in the two largest grants, those for elderly people and people with disabilities. The previous ratio in the level of the grants was of the order of 10 to 5 to 1. So f as a white person, um, it, it for a, I, I would have got 10 rand of a pension, for instance, um, versus Indian and colored people, excuse, excuse these expressions, would have got uh, five, and an African person would have got, would have got one. And this, the, this, the, the parity had been reached by, um, about halfway through 93. There was still a problem with the thing called the state maintenance grant for women and children. It was a budgetary problem in the sense that you couldn't equalize it easily because it depended on a Western definition of a nuclear family, which was quite unlike, as I will depict, um, what, what the actual reality of family life was in South Africa, which had been disrupted by colonialism and then apartheid. Very complex and fluid households, three generational households, many, many missing men. Um, and the question then arose, um, what are appropriate forms of support? The migrant labor system, and I'm talking about internal labor migrancy. There were also large numbers of people um, migrating into work, particularly on the mines from Zambia and Zimbabwe and Malawi, Botswana and Mozambique. But thinking of the internal migrant labor system, um, large numbers of women had children outside or before marriage and then having successive children with successive fathers, with different fathers. Large numbers of uh, men having two households, completely separate households, one in the rural, one in the urban area. Only about a third of households conforming to the norm of the nuclear family. So you couldn't, you couldn't 
equalize the grant, the state maintenance grant, in the same way as you could with a pension uh, for, an elder, for a single elderly person or a person with a disability. Very high rates of care by granny and older women, often in the absence of children's parents. It was a, a, a truly difficult situation. Um, and a very, a very uh, common picture would be this informal trader, granny, working in the streets of Durban, looking after grandchild on, on the street. I'm just going to give a couple of pictures for context. So this Lund Committee of Inquiry was it's very bizarre, that stuff, existentially, the Lund Committee of Inquiry. It makes me feel very wise um, because it worked. Um, uh, it was set up in 95, just after it was one of the government's first big commissions of inquiry, the new government. We were given nine months, which was ferocious, to come up with recommendations. And the main, and not the only recommendation, was for cash transfer for children from um, up, up to their seventh birthday. This was before the big Latin American program started coming down. And I think the influence was actually more from the child support benefits probably in England than it was. We later used the evidence from Progress and Oportunidades to endorse and consolidate the program and the, from the other Latin American countries. It came in in April 98 at about 100 rand a month at $10 a month per child in today's terms. And it had a very rapid um, out, outreach. Um, where today, well, last, last year, it's reaching um, 11.3 million of the 18 million children up to the age of 18 at about 300 rand per month. And it's now reached its last year of eligibility, 18. So the, the budget has settled down. It's stabilizing. The overall budget for pensions and grants is stabilizing, um, as far as we know, as far as you can make guesses about the future. Um, at about 3.5 percent of GDP. So the the welfare administrations were racially separate, um, and had been, but they were now integrated, but under strain. The poorest people lived in the more remote and underserved, particularly rural areas but where the civil services were very bloated, so that the puppet regimes which the apartheid government had set up, the Bantustans and the homelands, were a very fertile field for the replication of a bureaucracy. And the good news of that was it got roads out there, it got markets, it got housing out into fairly remote, remote areas. Um, there was a very high rhetoric about the developmental state, services for all and so on, but there was a system, and I'll come back to this, a system for the allocation and delivery of old age pensions and disability grants that was working, albeit with some problems. And I want to draw attention, I mean, to, to say that all the sums we're seeing now that are being done about the global social protection floor, which is a, a, a has been accepted by all of the United Nations agencies. The sums have been done on the basis of what gets paid, not on the basis of how you deliver what you're going to pay. And it's, a, it's an enormous um, issue, I think. And what we could do in South Africa was piggyback the child support grant onto an existing um, system of, of delivery. I'm going to need a glass of water. I can just, OK. So this is when I talk about a remote rural area. Um, I think there are three households you can see within this rather large um, uh, picture. Um, and and it, the question is how to run a system that, that, gets, that gets the social measure out there. I'm going to very quickly go through four or five slides which show the institution of the pension. The pension is brought in not job creation so much as periodic markets. You go around a corner. This is a tribal authority or a school that you see with all of the people. That will be a whole group of pensioners and people with disabilities lining up to get their uh, monthly pension. And there will be a market that gets set up, periodic market. Now you see it, now you don't, before it then follows the pension vans out there. Um, the pension lines are very orderly, 
Um, and they are also, apart from the markets that set up around them, are, uh, uh, we found with the child support grant that the pension days were the most reliable place to spread accurate information about the child support grant that was coming down. You had the, the audience right, right there, if you like. Um, pensions delivered by these um, four by four vehicles in the background through an automated teller um, system. And um, this just shows a, a blind pensioner getting assistance with entering her fingerprints. So the, the state is there. It's actually a privatized service, but the state is there to give assistance, which is interesting. Now we took the, goodness, what a lot of slides. Excuse me a second. An extremely important feature of the rapid acceptance of the child support grant was that there was already really good research that had been done about the impact of the pension for elderly people and led to a lesser extent to the impact of the pension for people with disabilities. Um, I have to say here that it really made a difference that Angus Deaton and Anne Case did some of the really, really good research showing the positive impacts early on. Others such as Esther de Flo and others um, followed on from that. There was a really, really good research going on in South Africa, but there's a kind of edge that you get when, when it's people from the north who come in and help. Um, the cash transfer for older people is and was pooled largely as household income. And the target, the point of the research was it showed that you could get money out to rural areas. Um, you could target it to women if that's what you chose to do. Um, women used to draw it earlier under the third bullet. But in fact, that, that age has now been, just last year, the equalization um, with, with men. It's been made gender proper now. It was very biased against men. Um, um, and, and women, we know that pension money is spent on the whole rather well. Um, there are positive links with enterprise creation, although that is not the purpose of it. Um, and with um, employment seeking behavior, um, and it crowds in a lot of caring by elderly people. Why I'm, it's, uh, this research on the old age pensions had actually shifted some of the attitudes towards and discourse about it, away from the idea that welfare spending is wasteful consumption spending, as opposed to, to pr productivity and growth enhancing spending. It, it, it settled the, that very turbulent arena somewhat so that you could introduce the idea of another grant um, into a more understanding field with, a, with, with very well-read ministers of finance and uh, very good uh, uh, leaders of the South African Revenue Services, which I'll get back to as a very important factor in the acceptance of the grant. What the committee wanted was to have a universal, not a targeted grant. We wanted first call for, for all children. We wanted something that would take into account the fact that children are highly mobile in their early years and are often not looked after by the biological parents. So follow the child. Where's that child going between those households? Um, follow the child via the primary caregiver who didn't have to be their biological parent. That's a huge breakthrough to have made. Um, um, it was to be unconditional, as all of the other grants in South Africa are um, up until just recently, and I'll raise that. And we wanted there to be synergies with health services, which some could call a conditionality. We can, we can, that doesn't, doesn't matter to me particularly. What was accepted by Cabinet was for a universal, it, what was not accepted was the universality, and a means test was imposed. Um, they accepted for the, follow the child, and they accepted via the primary caregiver, and that took quite a lot of intervention by the state legal advisors. Um, it was a wholly unconditional until 2012, and I'll get back to that as an obstacle that's just been introduced. And the health department said this was more than they could bear, was the idea to actually link this with full vaccine. We have very high rates of vaccination. 
when the, from, for those that children can get when they're born, but some you have to come back later. And we thought you could review the grant when people would come back for a vaccination. But in courses on Azuma, the then, thank you, that'll be fine, the then minister um, said, well, that actually she was dealing with stopping smoking, introducing abortion, um, trying to keep political stability in the face of something called the Cuban doctors who were coming in, that was about, about which there was a lot of paranoia, um, introducing generic um, drugs and, and introducing community service for all health professionals. And she said, like, I'm just really not interested. But one of the things at the, at the end is if other countries do take on such a cash, a, a child cash, a child-oriented cash transfer. I think this is an idea which could be so easily done in certain, in certain countries. Um, the difficult areas were that, the, that you have to get your birth registered and, and the adult has to have an, an identification card. And the, the problem is this Department of Home Affairs, um, which has been continually chaotic under very poor um, leadership. Um, there was, it, it, we were a very unversed country, an experienced country, I can say, in terms of purveying to the public what the point of a new policy measure is. The apartheid government, that they weren't really used to doing that very much. They just did what they wanted. Um, there, there were and are continuing myths about the, the grant causing teenage pregnancy, despite well-publicized research, which shows that this is not so. And then this conditionality was introduced very much by surprise in um, 2012. And I, I really do want to say why, you know, who, who said it should be, really? Um, it's it's a, a, an inefficient, unnecessary system where we do not, well, we don't have a problem with school attendance on the whole, but children who receive a child support grant have to get two letters a year from the school principal saying that they are attending school or not attending school. And schools don't, I mean, the areas where I live, they, they, there's no stationery in the schools whatsoever. Um, I'm going to skip over this, this issue, which just briefly was that um, we were given no, virtually no time for consultation and the, there was real civil society outrage, which I think dented the new government's legitimacy quite substantially. And I also think, and we might raise this in question time, I myself personally think that if we had had more consultation, we might have, not, we might have missed the opportunity to introduce the grant. The more conservative macroeconomic policy was coming down the line. The, all of the figures were being done better. And I wonder if it isn't one of these serendipitous areas where, where um, the, the good of consultation might have, might have led to the stalling on the ground. Um, and then the, I'm very, very near the, the end. Um, the grant was introduced for children 0 to 7. That's all we could get through the Budget Council at the time. And the, through civil society activity, the age of eligibility has been raised to 18 years old. And now there's a really tough policy problem in there. It's an extremely modest amount of money. Extremely. It doesn't take children out of poverty. It mitigates poverty doesn't take children out of poverty. Most of that money is used for food. And would you, my, my hunch for myself would be to say, and it's hard saying these words because I'm a kind of universal honcho, you know, universality one, is to say keep the years younger but give those children who get it more for seven to nine years to ensure those first precious years where you can't mediate, you can't intermediate um, um, the, 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 the deficits that you have, in the, especially in to five years old. So I think that's a difficult one. Um, so just the lessons so far, it's time, you know, history is, is a, but I mean, it was only introduced a few years ago. Its delivery was dependent on the existing delivery. The incredible importance of good research. We had a government that had ears, and still does, that had ears to listen. Taking evidence from other cash transfer programs in South Africa, and then as the evidence started coming in, particularly from Latin America, being able to use that to consolidate. 
um, research on management and, and, and monitoring the implementation and on the impact and outcomes um, of, of, the, of the effect of the child support grant. Um, it was easy to argue that there was no need for pilots or RCTs at that time, but that's maybe a digression here. I think one of the critically important things was that revenue services in South Africa were successfully improving revenue raising and was committed to allocating large parts of the additional revenue that was being raised um, to the pensions and grants. And it was sort of claimed as an important poverty program. So finally, in terms of the questions we were asked to answer here, it was an inclusive reform. It was the first step to citizenship for millions of young children. The, 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 what it did to birth registration, which many would say is a really important step in development, um, the, the figures for birth registration just shot up. It is fiscally sustainable as far as we know. It's not transformative. The amount per child is too small. The parallel programs with which synergy may have been possible have had mixed success. Um, and I think there are lessons in it for other countries from both the success and the failures. And would just like to, to draw your attention. The, the paper we submitted, there's a sort of short reading list there. There's a lot of um, references to, to the empirical studies. And there's also the short book I wrote um, about, uh, I wrote 10 years later, um, about the process of policy reform. And it's really, it's very interesting how much it is easily used as a teaching tool for students in political science, economics, um, sociology, whatever. It's, it's, I'm, I'm surprised by, I mean, I happen to have written it, but how many people say, it's, it's actually very, very funny. It's a bit macabre in places also, but that's nice. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a useful um, small case study, in a sense, 120 pages or so, and it's free online. And that's where I'll finish. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>